So I don't know if you know this, but I am Reverend Leslie Goodwin. <laughs> yeah, that's not going to get old. <laughs> and I want to extend uh, my own welcome to everybody here who is here for the first time, as well as beloved friends who are back after a long absence. And I have a lot of my family here. You guys know I have... Um, a lot of kids, right? This is not a, a secret. And um, my son Creighton and my son Chris and his beloveds Claire and Willow are here and my sister Lindsay is here. So thank you. And Bobby. Y'all know Bobby. We can clap for him too. <laughs> and I'm so grateful for, for every face, for every beloved, for every moment of support, for every time you asked how it's going for every prayer, for every thought, for every wish, for every one of you who told me I was definitely going to pass my panels. Thank you. Thank you for being here. So our topic this month is service, sacred service. I love this topic. It's such an essential part of our teaching, and it's such an essential part of what we do here at New Vision Center and in Centers for Spiritual Living for a number of reasons, one of which is Almost three-quarters of our congregation, of our members and friends, are involved in sacred service through our community in one way or another. And that is spectacular. This place doesn't run without service. You know, we're a, we're a mid-sized center. We are not an enormous center with an enormous budget. And so it truly is like a family coming together and everybody doing what we know how to do every day, every week, and somehow this magical thing happens where we get to come together and have this amazing band and these wonderful speakers and each other to lean into and to love. So just from that perspective, service is important, but it's also a spiritual practice. It's about more than doing what it takes to make this place happen. It's about what happens alchemically in our own bodies and our own minds and our own souls and our own lives when we step in at this different level where it's no longer about what can I get, what can I earn, what can I learn, and it's more about how can I be, how can I love, how can I show up as spirit in action no matter what I'm doing whether I'm serving the young ones in youth church, whether I'm scooping out salad at Munch and Mingle, whether I'm becoming a practitioner or even a minister. It's all layers of the same thing because we all start out in the same place. We all start out walking through these doors and saying there's something here that I want. There's something present in the lives of the people in this room that I can feel. You can feel it, right? I can feel it. And I know that somehow it's absent in my life right now, and I want it. And I'm willing to do what it takes to get there. And the first thing that it takes is exactly what's pointed to in our article of the month, which is the, the difference between, and to, to call back to Reverend Karen's talk earlier in the month, the difference between service helping, and fixing. I don't know about y'all, but I'm a recovering fixer. <laughs> I'm, and it's like any addiction, you have to keep working the system, got to keep working the program. I'm a recovering fixer. I have a degree in psychology and just enough knowledge to be dangerous. And little sisters. <laughs> But fixing comes from the place of believing that something is broken. We think we're saying the situation is broken, the relationship is broken, the circumstance is broken. But when we approach somebody to fix it, what we're really telling them is, sweetheart, I believe you are broken. I believe that you are not enough just the way you are. And so no matter how great our ideas are, all they hear is, you're not enough. And man, is that a tough lesson, right? Because here you think you've been, you've been fixing it, and all you've been doing is making it worse. Helping is a 
teeny tiny step in the right direction. I'm helping. I have something you need, and I can help you. I can give it to you. I can do it for you. I can make it happen for you. I'm, I'm abundant, and I'm generous, and I'm going to help you. But what they're hearing is, I don't think you can do it. I see your weakness. I don't think you have the strength, so I'll just do it for you. I'll just help you. And oh, here we've been working so hard to be helpful. It's just me, right? I'm the only one who's had this experience. Here we've been trying so hard to be helpful and do this helpful thing, and they're hearing, I see you're weak. I see you're not good enough. I see you're not enough. But when we come from a place of service, from that depth of service, a servant's heart says, I see your wholeness. I know you can do it. I know who you are. I see to the center of your being. I see it. I see God in there. I know it. How can I be of service? How can I connect my wholeness with your wholeness to help you remember who you are yourself. It may not look different from the outside, but you ask that person being served or helped or fixed, and they know. They know if they've been served or helped or fixed, and it is imperative on us to learn the difference right now. Right now. Because otherwise, we're not doing anybody any good, including ourselves. So my topic today is the divine yes. And it it reminds me of this story that's a Hasidic tale. It's so brief but so precious that Rabbi Zusya, I'm really proud of myself for learning how to pronounce that properly, (laughs) Rabbi Zusya um, said, you know, when I get to the pearly gates, when I make it into heaven and I stand there, they are not going to ask me, why were you not Moses? They're going to ask me, why were you not Zosia? That there is a place in us that is called to the highest of the high, that is the truth of who we are. And when we connect with that divine yes, we are always in service. We are in service to the people in front of us, We are in service to the people who come to us for service. And we're in service of humanity, of the divine good of everyone and everything, because it's literally what we're called forth to be. And every day in this beloved, wonderful place, people come into our office, into Reverend Karen's office and mine, and say things like, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. Why do I feel stuck? Why do I feel empty? I know I'm called to something, but I don't know what it is. I'm so afraid. I'm so afraid that I'm wasting my life. I'm so afraid that I am screwing this up. Well, here's a little little tip. You cannot do life wrong. You cannot do it wrong. Even if every single thing I've called out so far in this talk, you're like, oh, crap. I do all of those things. In this moment, you have the opportunity to say, with one new thought, everything changes. Our goal is not to be perfect every single day. Our goal is to get there, wherever there is. And there is where love speaks louder than anything else. Clifford Cohen said, who you essentially are, the reason you were put on this earth, is what you never grow tired of being. When we find that place of calling, we never grow tired of it. If you're wondering if what you're doing is your calling, there's your answer right there. But in order to to live a life of pure connected service, in order to live a life of your calling, you have to be in the place of the divine yes. You have to be in the flow of life, which looks a little bit like this. Well, yeah, it looks like that too. In the flow of life. There's the river of goodness, the 
river of goodness. And it's just going, right? It's just going with good, with money and jobs and fun and, and friends and things to watch on television. I really, really like Netflix. Wonderful books and fabulous classes, and it's just going, right? It's just going. And we can just stand there in it like this and just whoosh, whoosh, starts going in the flow of life. But are you a no to the flow of life? Are you a no to the flow of life? Because when you are, it looks like this. You're standing in the river. It's coming. It's coming. And you think something like, well, I don't know if I really want a waterfall. I mean, it's still there. You just don't get it. Waterfall. You're in the flow. Well, maybe I don't. I don't know that that's a good idea to do. Waterfall. The good isn't gone. We can't get rid of it, right? I mean, the good is God. But it goes somewhere else. Because we have said, no thank you. When my kids were little, I made them take two no thank you bites of every food they said they did not like. One no thank you bite is not enough. Because they can, you know, have you ever seen a kid take a bite of something they don't want? They had to take two, and they had to be real bites, and they had to chew them and swallow them. One, one time Creighton, I'm so sorry, Creighton. Well, he knows this is coming, too. One time Creighton took his two no thank you bites of something with mushrooms in it because he hated mushrooms, and why was I trying to kill him? And after the second bite, he goes, I forgot. I love mushrooms. <laughs> he insists now that he actually probably just liked the sauce that was on the mushrooms, but I will take it. He ate the mushroom dish. He ate it. When we're living in resistance, the flow stops. We just shut it off. We're not in the yes of life. We're in the no thank you bite of life. I do not like sweet potatoes. Waterfall. I'm afraid to try the waterfall. That's not how we do it here. What happens? The good's not gone. It's just I don't get it anymore. Unless I'm going over the waterfall, and I've had that day too. The biggest one I hear, the, the one that I think is particularly insidious, is you're in the flow, you're in the flow. Something goes by, and you're like, well, I don't know for sure that I want that one. It looks good. I might want it. Job, boyfriend, vacation. Is it, it's just me that's not always 100% sure if I want something. Yeah, I figured it was just me. And we say, well, I don't know yet. There is not a little pool over here for the maybes. Waterfall. But we can, we can be a yes for what is. We can be a yes for life in general, in the place of allowing what is. Just because we are a yes for something existing doesn't mean it has to be for me. I can just be a yes. Yes to that awesome relationship. Am I ready for a relationship yet? I don't know, but I'm a yes to that. Yes to that awesome new job. Is that a career I would want? I don't know. But I'm a yes for me getting the career that makes me feel the way that career makes that person feel. I'm a yes. I'm a yes for that. And what happens then is we might not be fly fishing, in the stream of life, but we're in it. We're still in it. And things that are meant for us, the law of divine compensation says, if some good is meant for us and we are in the yes place, even if we miss that fish, it will circle around back to us. Every time, we can't do life wrong. We can't do it wrong. There's this thing, you might have heard about it, it's God. You might have heard about it. Spirit, the universe, the divine mind, whatever you want to call it. I'm on kind of a God kick this week. It just continues to bring that good back to you. You can't do it wrong. All you can do is refuse to do it. And that's what being in the know of life is about. It's about, mm -mm, you can't make me. You can't make me have a better job. That sounds scary. 
Can't make me follow my dreams. That makes me nervous. Can't make me try a relationship. Mm -mm. Nope. I don't know if I can get any more cross. Like, I've got to try some of my, those yoga positions where you close your body off so completely that, you know, no good can possibly get to you. You have to be open enough to try. You have to be open enough to celebrate the good in everybody else's life when you see it. That's called being in the flow of life. And only at that point are you open to your divine yes, to your divine calling. Have you ever noticed that treatment, spiritual mind treatment, our form of affirmative prayer, is entirely yes? Entirely yes. Step one is yes to God, to the amazing, full, profound depth and power and grace and beauty and love and wholeness that is God. Yes. Yes. Yes, yes. Step two is unifying with that. That goodness lives in me, even if I don't see it right now. Yes? Yes. Step three is realizing that because that's the truth of who I am and because God is every single cell in my body and every single thought that I think and every single thing that I am and all of the energy that runs through me, everything I could ever want is already right here for me. Yes? yes. Step four is being grateful for this truth and knowing that it is right where I am right now all the time. Yes? yes. And releasing that into the law. Step five means trusting God to do God's work. So we can get out of its way and start having a great time. Yes? Yes. Y'all yes. know your homework now. So then we get to the divine yes. We get out of our own way. We shut off the nose and we start being a yes to the good that we see out there, to the good that we feel in here. We start treating and pulling it in and deepening it and allowing it to be who and what we are. And when we're in that place, we have the opportunity to recognize that something special is calling each and every one of us. And I don't want us to get stuck on the word special. I don't mean that you have to go make a documentary or paint a certain painting or whatever you think special means. Special just means specially for you. What is it that you love? What is it that flows through you so easily that you think, I wish I could do this instead of go to work? What kind of relationship are you in that you think, I wish I could just hang out with this person all the time and not go hang out with that person? It doesn't have to be your job. It doesn't have to be your marriage. It doesn't have to be anything, but there is something profound that lifts you up from the inside. And when you are a yes to that Everything else falls into place. You don't need to know how, because God knows how. You don't have to pay for it, because everything God calls you to, God has to pay for. That's my rule. It has worked for me thus far. <laughs> Ministerial school got paid for. It was not inexpensive. <laughs> you don't have to know anything. And in fact, trying to know puts you right back in your no. I'm going to say that again because it's really important. Trying to know puts you back into your no. Waterfall. It's none of your business. It's none of your business to know how or when or where the money's going to come from or who's going to do what. No. Yes. Yes. Ernest Holmes, the founder of our teaching, said, we let go and let God. We need only be receptive to the gift. We know that when we ask, God always says yes. God always says yes. We have to ask, and we have to be in the yes, because that's what we're pressing into that law, that law that always says, like it says in the Bible, when two or more ask, believing, it must be done unto you. It must be done unto you, and what you ask is given. I am a standing, walking, praying, joke-telling example of the power of this truth. I showed up here 11 and a half years ago, barely functioning, 
mid-terrible divorce. Two little kids. I had no idea how it was going to take care of. No money. Very little prospects. Not a real good idea what was going to happen. I had an undergraduate degree in psychology, which basically qualifies you to work at a call center. I was pretty sure that was not my divine calling. For somebody, it might be, and for them, kill it. But I knew that there was something more for me, and I walked into this community so fragile that I wouldn't let them hug me at the door because I was sure I would shatter into a million pieces. The epitome of feeling broken. And I took a class, and I listened, and I read, and I prayed, and I learned how to do spiritual mind treatment, which I know, I know, I know is a lot of steps, but trust me, it's worth it. And I took more classes, and I prayed, and I got a practitioner. I want to say that again because it's really important. I got a practitioner that I did not only see when I was having a nervous breakdown, which at this time was frankly relatively often, but that I saw at least once a month, no matter what. And I learned that that money was very well spent. And I took more classes. And I got very brave and started practitioner training. And I met my husband because I was brave enough to treat for what I really wanted. And we piled all of our kids into one house, which was very noisy, but pretty awesome. <laughs> And I kept taking classes, and I kept praying, and I kept seeing that practitioner, and I just kept going. And there were times, for sure, I thought, I can't afford this. I knew, I knew before I started prac training that I was going to be a minister. It wouldn't shut up. That inner voice, anybody got the inner voice that won't shut up? Yeah. Whatever it is, it's going, right? It's going. It would not shut up. And I, I still have kids in high school. I can't afford it right now. I have a million reasons not to do it. Go, go, go. It just kept going. And when I said yes, every single thing solved itself. Why? Because it was not my job to fix it. It was God's job to fix it. It was not my job to make the road. It was God's job to make the road. It wasn't even my job to walk in the door that very first day. It was God's job because I am not sure I could have taken those steps all the way through practitioner and ministerial school and exams and paneling last week in Denver and standing here right now. I'm not sure I'm giving this talk either. I'm not sure I gave any of my talks. I'm not sure I will ever give any of my talks, which is awesome because the infinity of the universe probably does a better job of that than I would. It makes sense. But if it can happen to me, a very sad young woman from Iowa living in Phoenix, falling apart, there is no way I could ever be convinced that there's anyone in this room that is blocked or immune from their divine calling, from their divine yes. Just take the steps. Just be in the flow. That's all anything and anyone ever asks of you. So here's the call. My call, not God's call. God's call is probably bigger. Here's my calling to you. Do the work. Do the prayer. Do the meditation. Do the work. Get a practitioner, whether you need one or not, because we all need one. If any person ever stands on the stage and says they're beyond needing a practitioner, fire them. That's something Michelle Madrano says all the time. Get them out of here because the work never ends. There's no there there. Do your work. Get a practitioner. Start being a yes. You will be amazed the way life says yes back to you. Let's take that into prayer. There is only one, one infinite power that we call God, that we call spirit, that we call divine mind, that we call the energy of the universe that is flowing in and through and as all of its own creation. 
which is literally everything. Every person, every place, every relationship, every job, every everything is God in form, forever making more of itself and pouring forth its own abundance into its creation. It is love and wholeness, it is health and beauty, it is power and grace and courage, the courage to become more all the time. And what I know for myself is that I'm that. I accept nothing less than the infinitude of the universe as the source of my being because there's nothing else to be. If God is all there is, there is nothing else to be. So I'm that. And I know that that's true for every beloved within the sound of my voice because it's true for everyone everywhere. There is only one. There's nothing else to be. So we are that perfection. We are that wholeness. We are that power. We are that abundance. All of it, right where we are, whether we see it in this moment or not, it's there in its full potentiality built into our very DNA. And so when I know that truth and I look out upon this amazing community, what I know for each and every one of us is that God is right where we are, offering infinity, offering a connection to the highest call, personally designed for each one of us to live our very highest and fullest and most deeply serving life. And all we ever have to do is say yes. And mountains move. And miracles happen. And things align. And we are served. And we are prospered. And we are uplifted. And we are empowered. Because that's the way the universe is designed. Literally created for our good. And I am so thankful. I'm thankful to know that the words I speak right now are the truth and the heart and mind of God because they always have and they always will be. God is the unchanging, the infinite, the all good. And we have always been that all good. And I am so grateful to know it absolutely for myself, for New Vision Center, for every beloved that hears my voice. And so I simply take this word and press it into that law of universal action knowing that God's promise is true that that which is asked in the two or more must be given and it is good and so it is